Hi everyone, it is me, Miss Willis, and I'm here to talk to you today about ecology. So this is going to go over some of the basics of ecology. We're going to learn about interactions and competitive exclusion and all the things that you really see occurring in a system. So let's go ahead and get started. If you've ever wondered what an ecologist does, well, what they do is they study living organisms and how they interact with their non-living environment. So they observe, they look for relationships, and they see how species are interacting with each other, but then also with other things in the area. When ecologists go into an area, they do notice, like I said, a lot of interactions. Um, they make careful observations about biotic factors that exist in the area. So these are things that are living, such as animals and plants and fungi. But then they also make observations and recordings about the abiotic things that exist in the area. And those are the things that are not living. So things like water movement, air patterns, um, even soil or dirt, if you're just talking about the dirt and not the living things in the soil. There is a hierarchical system that exists in ecology. So if we're starting off from the smallest living organism, that would be obviously an organism or species, you put those together, you get populations and then communities, ecosystems, biomes, and of course the biosphere, which is the earth. So let's go ahead and go through some of these. An organism or a species, which is a group of that same organism, is a group of individuals that can mate and produce viable offspring. So I think that's key. So if you classify an organism as a species, they have to be able to mate with each other and they have to produce offspring that can also produce offspring. A population is a group of organisms of the same species. So right here you do see these ring-tailed lemurs. There's three of them, which we can classify as a very small population. A community, which is bigger than a population, is a group of populations interacting together. So here you see this coral reef environment, but you do notice there are different populations of fish and they are interacting in this habitat. An ecosystem is the next level in the hierarchical scale. And this is a group of communities that are interacting with the living components of that system, as well as that non-living component or components. So things like water and soil and air. When you take a look at that, as well as all the communities, now we're talking about the ecosystem level. We also have the biome level, which is a group of ecosystems that interact together. You may be comfortable with some of the biomes that you learned in middle school, such as um, the tundra, taiga, you have chaparral, et cetera. Lastly, the biggest piece of the ecological hierarchical scale is the biosphere. And the biosphere is really just another name for the living earth. It is all the biomes that are interacting together. In 1979, a professor named James Lovelock did propose what we call the Gaia hypothesis. And what this hypothesis says is that Earth is connected. So all the components on Earth are connected, all the organisms and the non-living abiotic factors. And ultimately, what the Earth is trying to do is to self-regulate itself. So it strives to maintain homeostasis. And when things are out of balance, the Earth will work to put that balance back. Now let's take a look at an ecosystem that has uh, three communities interacting with each other. And so we're going to look at the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem. This is where the Potomac River meets the Atlantic Ocean. To give you an idea of where this Chesapeake Bay is located, um, you can see here in the maps, it's definitely on the east coast of the United States, which is far away from where we are, and it is in between states such as Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. 
The first community that is in the Chesapeake Bay system is the Potomac River. Now, this is a river system, so it's fresh water, and that means it does have very low salinity. So the organisms that live there have adapted to conditions of very low salt levels. A lot of times people think fresh water does not contain salt, but it does, just very, very low amounts. Uh, a second community that you may see in this area is an estuary, and these are places where salt and fresh water meet. The water that is there is termed brackish because it is a mixture of fresh and salt water. So there is salt in the water, there is low salinity, but not as high as in the ocean. Here is a picture of the Chesapeake Bay Estuary, so you can see that mixture of salt and fresh water. And the third system you have in the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem is the emptying of that river into an ocean, and it does empty into the Atlantic Ocean. Oceans tend to have high salinity concentrations, even though the ocean is only 3.5% salt. Just a little side note, some areas of the Chesapeake Bay are significantly eutrophied. That means you will find excessive algae growth, um, usually because nutrients are being added into the water, usually unnecessarily, um, and it does prevent many species from living there. Many of these biological communities, they lack defined boundaries. So there really is no isolation between like a freshwater river to an estuary. They blend together. And because you have this blending of communities, you will see organisms developing what are called niches or niches. And these are the roles that these organisms play in their ecosystem. So for example, the niche of a lion would be to be top predator. A scientist named Gauss discovered what we now call the competitive exclusion principle. And what this says is that if there are two species with very similar requirements, for example, they live in the same habitat, they eat the same food, they usually cannot occupy the same niche, they can't coexist, and they cannot live together in that same environment. And the very famous experiment um, in which this is seen is with paramecium. So you have two different species, Cadatum and Aurelia, but they, they do have a very, very similar niche. So take a look at paramecium Aurelia. So it's being grown by itself alone, and you can see it takes on a logistic growth pattern. So it grows and then levels off. The same thing happens with paramecium caudatum. So when they're grown alone, same logistic growth pattern, they increase and then level off. So what do you think is going to happen when we put the two together? If they share a very similar niche, what is going to happen? Well, they compete with each other and one excludes the other. So Aurelia is pretty much the winner and caudatum is the loser. So Aurelia can outcompete Condatum in that niche, in that area. One thing that species have done to be able to coexist if they have similar niches is they do what's called resource partitioning. So these organisms, they tend to live obviously in the same habitat but what they have evolved to do is to use resources in different ways places or different times so that the competition that they face can be reduced and then that way they can coexist. So for example, the anole lizards in the Caribbean, um, some have learned to live higher in the trees, like in the crowns, some live near the ground and some live on the limbs of the trees. And because of that, they have reduced competition for things such as food source as well as habitat.